you know, it's, it's much more complicated when you teach online and use PowerPoint and all that kind of thing than it used to be when I started teaching. We, I just have handwritten notes and a blackboard and uh, maybe an overhead projector. And it's a lot more complicated now. Hopefully it's better now. All right. Um, we were getting into the introduction to the introduction to New Testament. And we looked at uh, different areas that we are going to um, be using. And let me bring this up here. Let's see. All right, we'll do the screen share. Okay. Now, the purpose of this course is to acquaint you with the literature of the New Testament. So we will be looking at the historical, cultural, social, and religious settings. Um, and we will discuss the introductory matters of each book that we have up here. We're also going to uh, Sorry, no, we, we, yeah, there's a problem with the sound. We are oh, having the sound. Yeah. Okay, let me uh, put on my headphones. Thank you. All right, can you hear me? Uh, okay. Um, to understand a written work, you need to understand the context in which it was written, the historical and cultural contact, and also the particular relationships of the writer with the readers. And we're gonna study that in this class. Uh, this course will also be an introduction to New Testament studies in general. Uh, we're going to look at where we are on the map of New Testament studies and where are the major scholars on the map. So we'll be discussing liberal scholars, evangelical scholars, and Pentecostal scholars. We'll need to think critically or analytically. We'll look at positions that we don't agree with. And that's okay. You know, we don't need to be afraid of reading somebody that we disagree with. Uh, all truth is God's truth. And we don't need to agree with those who have different viewpoints from us, but we need to understand them. And we need to know how to defend our position on the issue. Uh, next, I want to ask a question that you might not think we would need to ask uh, in this kind of a course, but that is why study the New Testament? Uh, here are some reasons that have been given. It's great literature, and it certainly is great literature. The, the English uh, language has been impacted by the King James Version of the Bible. Um, to be a truly educated person, you need to be familiar with the content of the New Testament. But that is not really the reason that we uh, study the New Testament. 
Another possible reading uh, me, uh, reason is that it is a great book on morals, which it is. Um, and hold on just a second here. I'm trying to go on on my other computer and it's trying to log me out. So hold on just a second here. Well, my technology is not cooperating today. So I'll, I'll leave that for later. Um, another possible reason is that it's impor an important book historically. Um, and so it deserves our attention, which it certainly is. The Bible, the New Testament in particular, has shaped the history of Western civilization uh, like nothing else. And in order to understand that, we need to understand the New Testament. But the New Testament tells of God's plan for the universe, for mankind, for the church, and for history itself. It speaks of redemption, justification, and a loving God who is at work in our world. The greatest reason that we study the New Testament is that in it, we hear the voice of God. God speaks to us through the New Testament. Here we read of a God who loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son to become a man, to enter into our world of sin and sorrow, to identify with us, to die on a cross for us, and to rise again the third day uh, with power to help us in whatever we face in our lives. In the New Testament, God speaks his perfect and authoritative word to us. When we read those pages, we hear the voice of God. That is the reason that the study of the New Testament is crucial for us. Of course, not everyone agrees with this estimation of the New Testament. Scholars like Bart Ehrman and others view it merely as an interesting book, uh, historically important, or a great book of literature. Our orientation in this class is going to be what the orientation of the church has been for two millennia, that the New Testament is the inspired, infallible, authoritative word of God. Let us look at the name. The word testament comes from the Latin word testamentum, uh, which is the translation of the Greek word diatheke, meaning covenant. So here we have on the PowerPoint, he kine diatheke, the New Testament or covenant. Originally, the New Testament or covenant referred to the Christian religion itself and the 27 books of uh, what we call books of the New Covenant or the books of the New Testament. But by the second century AD, uh, the books themselves came to be called the uh, New Testament. Now, why is it called the New Testament? Why is it called new rather than just testament? Uh, somebody answer. What do you think? Why is it called the New Testament? Yeah. Anybody have an idea? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm hearing noise. Yeah. Does, does somebody have their uh, their speaker on? For their... Okay, I think it's stopped now. Okay, their mic. Their mic. Um, why do we call it the New Covenant? Why don't we just call it the because Covenant? We have all... uh, what is that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, perhaps it must be because there is the Old Testament and now we have the fulfillment of the 
All right. The covenant because the promise as well that has been fulfilled. Okay. Uh, can all of you hear well? Uh, that was really my hearing. So could could all of you hear it well? No, it was broken up for me too. It's breaking up. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, ah. it's breaking up for me as well. Okay, well we'll try to see. Is it we'll okay now? Can you hear me? It's it it isn't it isn't clear. Uh, Piers, can can you say something? Let's see if yours is clear. Hi, my name's Piers. Okay, yeah, that's clear. Okay. All right. Let us go ahead and, um, and get back to uh, the content here. Uh, we call it the New Testament, like, like Chikara said, because there was already a testament. And that is what we call the Old Testament. That is the covenant that we have in the Old Testament. Now, really, there was more than one covenant there. And uh, uh, we have the covenant with with Abraham, the covenant with uh, Moses, uh, the covenant with Noah. And generally, when the, the New Testament refers to the old, it is referring either to the covenant with Abraham or the covenant with uh, Moses. So we call it the New Testament because uh, it contrasts it with the Testament that came before. Uh, this word diatheke uh, is usually translated covenant in the Bible. Uh, and a covenant is a, an agreement between two parties. But the word diatheke in the Bible has a special meaning. Yes, it is an agreement between two parties, but they are not equal parties. When two equal parties enter into an agreement, as in a business contract, it's called a suntheke. The concept of covenant in the uh, New Testament comes from the Old Testament concept of covenant. There was a covenant uh, in the Old Testament, but it wasn't between two equals. God didn't negotiate with the Israelites or with Abraham uh, and come up with a mutually agreed upon contract uh, with stipulations binding on both parties and uh, that either party could nullify. Rather, God gave the children of Israel his covenant, and all they could do was to accept it or reject it, to keep it or break it. And since God made it, only he could change or nullify it. The closest thing we have in our world today to that is a last will and testament. Uh, before somebody dies, they write out their last will and testament, and it gives direction as what should happen to their property after they've died. Only that person can change it, or only that person can nullify it, uh, get rid of it. Uh, somebody else can't. And uh, this parallel between the covenant and the last will and testament is brought out in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 to 22. In Old Testament times, uh, there were two kinds of covenants between nations. <clears throat> Sometimes nations would enter into mutual agreements uh, called parity treaties. These were nations that were more or less equal parties. But there was another kind of agreement that closely paralleled the covenant between Yahweh and the people of Israel. It was a treaty uh, made between a conquering nation and a conquered nation nation, and it's called a suzerain-vassal treaty. Uh, by su suzerain, it refers to the conquering nation, and vassal refers to the conquered nation. And as you look at these treaties, we see that they are 
uh, almost perfectly parallel with the covenant that God made with the people of Israel in the Old Testament. The conquering nation gave the treaty to the conquered nation, and the conquered nation would either accept it or reject it, uh, but they better accept it because they were conquered. Um, the Suzerain Vassal Treaty looked something like this. It had a preamble. It would uh, have the introductory uh, sentences, and then it would give a historical prologue. It would tell what events led up to that. And then the stipulations of the treaty. There were general clauses. There were specific stipulations. There were divine witnesses or guarantors. So they would call upon their gods to witness and guarantee the treaty. There were maledictions or curses for breaking the treaty and benedictions or blessings for keeping it. Now, here are some examples from the Old Testament. If you look at Exodus 19, 3 through 8, or Exodus 20, 1 through 17, the Ten Commandments, or Joshua chapter 24, uh, you can see here how these elements appear. Uh, the preamble in Exodus 19 is verse 3. Historical introduction, verse 4. General principles for future conduct, verse 5a. And go on down and on down. Now, not all of these appear in all of these scripture passages, but it's a, it's a very close parallel that we have. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, was God's gracious provision for Israel. By it, he, <clears throat> he entered into a covenant relationship with them. He offered them his covenant and his rich blessings. They, in turn, were to keep uh, the, uh, the provisions of the covenant. And this was God's way of dealing with his people in the Old Testament. But in Jesus, God initiated a new covenant, a new way of dealing with mankind. Uh, this was foretold by the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. And let me just read that for you. There it says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. And this was fulfilled in Jesus. In him, God graciously offered to mankind his provisions, which mankind can accept or reject, but not alter. Jesus, in passing the cup at the Last Supper, said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So Jesus established the new covenant. He kaine diatheke, the new agreement between God and man. And so that is, uh, this is God's new agreement in contrast to the old agreement. Or we could even say that it is the reaffirmation and the changing, the updating of God's 
covenant with Abraham, God promised that Abraham would uh, bless the world through his posterity. And we see that fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, do you have questions or comments here before we go on? If you do, just speak out. All right. Uh, let us look <clears throat> uh, just to an overall of the content of the New Testament. The New Testament is a collection of 27 books written by nine different authors over a period of some 50 years. We can, first of all, look at it in terms of its character, look at the different books in terms of, of, it, of their character. Uh, now, the, the uh, New Testament books have been analyzed in several different ways. System one, by genre. And by genre, we're talking about the type of literature that it is. Uh, it would be divided into gospels, history of the church, epistles, and apocalyptic. And so this is the way it would look. The gospels, 47% of the New Testament, uh, are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. History of the church, 13% is Acts. The epistles are 33%. 23% uh, are Paul's letters, 4% Hebrews, 6% general epistles, and then apocalyptic, 7% is the book of Revelation. So by genre, uh, we would divide the, uh, the books this way. Now, this is basically the order uh, that we have the books in the New Testament. Uh, the epistles uh, are, first of all, those written by Paul, starting with epistles to the churches and then epistles to individuals. Within those divisions, they go more or less by size. Romans is the longest. 1 Corinthians is the next longest, 2 Corinthians, uh, down through 2 Thessalonians. The only exception to that is Galatians is a little shorter than Ephesians. But uh, other than that, it's longest to shortest. And then the same thing to individuals. Uh, 1 Timothy through Philemon. 1 Timothy is the longest. Philemon is the shortest. And then come the general epistles and the book of Revelation. We could look at them by function. Uh, first of all, we have uh, the historical books. There are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts. The common element in these works is that they tell a story. Um, they are in some sense history. And then we come to the doctrinal books. Here we have the letters that were written to churches, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st John, and Jude. And then we have uh, personal, the personal writings are those letters that were written to individuals, not groups. And these include 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and 2nd and 3rd John. At least one of these is a very personal letter, uh, the letter to Philemon, uh, urging Philemon to receive back a slave that had run away and had gotten converted by the Apostle Paul. And Paul well, uh, encourages him to welcome uh, Onesimus back as a brother. And then prophetic is the book of Reco uh, Revelation, 
which we could also call apocalyptic. Now, these four categories here are not airtight compartments. Uh, the Gospels and Acts are also doctrinal uh, documents, and there's a lot of doctrine in the personal letters and so forth. We could divide it up by author. And this is the way they would be grouped. Uh, Matthew wrote Matthew. Mark wrote Mark. Luke wrote Luke and Acts. John wrote John, the three Johannine epistles and Revelation. James wrote James. Jude wrote Jude. Paul wrote 13 letters. Peter wrote two letters, and we don't know who wrote Hebrews. Uh, traditionally, it was uh, thought to be written by Paul, but um, I don't know of any major scholar today who would say that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, we could also divide it by time periods, by the chronological order in which uh, they were written. We have the period of inception, 6 BC to AD 30. Now, this period covers the life of Christ. Notice that while this period is what is covered in the Gospels, no books of the New Testament were written during this period. Even though the inception of the New Testament took place, the, the uh, books of the New Testament were all written after this period. And then we have the period of expansion, AD 30 to 60. This is the period of the Apostle Paul's greatest missionary activity. The book of Acts covers most of this period. Most of Paul's epistles were written during this time. And then the period of consolidation. Uh, before we get to that, let me ask you a question. If you wanted to find the earliest account of the Lord's Supper, where would you go? Where in the New Testament would you look for the earliest account of the Lord's Supper? Uh, just speak out. First Corinthians. Okay. I heard somebody say First Corinthians. Who was that? Me, Gustavo. Gustavo, okay. Yes, you're right. Because Paul's letters generally were written before the Gospels were written. So the earliest account we have of the Lord's Supper is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And then in the period of consolidation, uh, during this time, the church began to take on a more structured character as we see in the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Um, we are less sure of the events that happened during this time because we have no acts of the apostles that uh, happened during this time. Um, the book of Acts ends uh, shortly after AD 60 with Paul being in prison in Rome. But there is no Acts 2. I wish there were. It would be very enlightening for us. Uh, but there isn't. Uh, it was during this time that most of the apostles died. Um, most of them were martyred. In fact, within a five-year period, the major leaders of the church were all martyred. In AD 62, uh, James was stoned in Jerusalem. Uh, a little bit later than that, the apostles Paul and Peter were martyred under Nero in Rome. Short period of time, the main leaders of the church are gone, and yet the church continued to grow and grow and grow. <coughs> now, the order in which the books were written cannot be uh, determined precisely. The order that's given in Carson and Moo uh, is quite representative of the current, uh, of the uh, conservative position on which books were written first and uh, which were written later on. Perhaps we should say a word about the order of the books that we have in the New Testament. Um, here is the order in the uh, three best and oldest Greek manuscripts and in the Latin Vulgate. 
In the left column, we have uh, Codex Alex Alexandrinus and Codex Vaticanus. And this is the order in which we see the books in that uh, manuscript. In the middle column, it's Codex Sinaiticus, uh, or it's called uh, Well, it's, it's Codex Aleph. I don't have it in my notes here. But um, this is the order that we have it in Codex Sinaiticus. Again, these are early Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. And then in the third column, we have the order in the Latin Vulgate. Now, notice that the order in our Bibles are in the order of the Latin Vulgate. So our order is the right-hand column here. Uh, when you study the New Testament, either New Testament introduction or New Testament theology or New Testament backgrounds, you need to include uh, the second century in that up, or up to the year 200, because so much of our study of the New Testament uh, is impacted by what happened during the second century. So we need to have a grasp of early church history. Uh, areas of the formation of the New Testament, the canon, and so forth play an important role in New Testament studies. All right. Um, let me just stop the screen share here. And let me ask if you have any questions. Any questions? No questions. Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Who said that? Um, Gustavo. <laughs> Gustavo, okay. Yeah. It is regarding the covenant. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that word right. Susenial, su, well, it is, no, no, no. The style of covenant that was used in the Old Testament and that was this kind of the higher power dicta oh, dictates okay. what is, okay. So yeah. it, we have in the Old Testament a written form of it that all Jew people will agree this is the covenant and everything else will beat around that. Do we have something like that for the New Testament? Like it's a written form, except for the words of Jesus or or how can we determine this is the new covenant that yeah, we agree we, upon? Yeah, we don't have a written agreement like, like in the Old Testament. Uh, what we have is the teaching of Jesus and the writings of the uh, New Testament writers so it, it's not a formal written uh, agreement like we have in the Old Testament. Yeah, but it is God's way of dealing with his people, starting with Jesus. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I always thought the book of Mark was the first gospel written. Yes, it was. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, Mark, it's generally believed is the first gospel. Now, not everybody agrees with that, and, and we'll get into this uh, quite a bit. Oh, okay. Cool. But yes, um, but the, the point that I was making was that Paul's letters were written before the yes. gospels. Yes. Yeah, got it. Uh, Peter, did you have a question? No, you just answer. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yes, Miles. Yes, doctor. Uh, with the question of Gustavo, uh, can we say that uh, Jesus himself is the is the agreement that he he, he is the letter he portrays the agreement or he, his life is expression of such covenant that brings life and healing uh, to people in, uh, in parallel with the Old Testament that we are asking for. I think we can, can say we that. I think we could say that metaphorically, mm -hmm. okay? It, it's not uh, an actual written document, yeah. but we can say, you know, in his life and ministry and teaching, we can see God's new way of dealing with mankind. Yes. 
Yes. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Do you have insight that you would like to give? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I would like to add something. Yes. Uh, it, it, is, it comes with the idea of uh, the gospel being written after the letters of all the, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because ministering in the world of min Muslim world, you come across with a lot of those arguments. Like Muslims say that the deification, let's say that way of Jesus Christ came up after Paul's letter. That it was not something that re it was before, so I think it is it is one of those arguments that Muslims bring, mm -hmm. considering that they they are right in the sense that the Gospels were written after Paul's letters, and they argue that it was Paul who introduced the Jesus as God, which is a a very complicated thing, uh -huh. but. Um, so it is in your experience or suggestions, how do you do you, you know how to address that issue with them? Of course, we have all the historical background and all the that Jesus was a real person in history and all that. Yes. Have you ever yes. encountered these kind of arguments yourself? I, I haven't argued with somebody about that, but I've looked at the uh, the evidence, you know, uh, that we're dealing with. Um First of all, I said that the epistles were written before uh, the Gospels. That is not uniformly true because there were some epistles that were written later, uh, especially the general epistles. Um, when were the Gospels written? Generally, it's believed that they were written um, in the 60s at, at the, the the uh, first ones were written in the 60s and go up to maybe 80. Um, but there are those who say, no, uh, Mark was actually written much earlier. And um, what we need to deal with also is the fact that we have eyewitness testimony in the Gospels. Um, in fact, there's a, uh, a new book that has been written by a great scholar Richard Baucom, and called, uh, it's called uh, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. It's now come out in a second edition. And it, um, it makes the case for what we have in the Gospels as being eyewitness testimony. Um, and Matthew, for example, he would have taken notes, you would think, because he was a clerical kind of person. He was a tax collector. You know, he wasn't a fisherman who didn't carry a pen in his pocket. I mean, he was a person who probably would take notes. And um, so those, it, it may actually be not only eyewitness testimony, but actually recorded during the life of Jesus as well. So um, I, I, to say that the idea about Jesus was changed over time and that uh, Paul saw Jesus as God and then that got back into the Gospels, that just won't hold water. That, that, just, that just won't work, okay? And we're going to go into this in quite a bit of detail, okay? Uh, let's take a break and come back in 10 minutes, all right? God bless you. All right, 
Um, we are now going to the history of New Testament criticism. Uh, as we do this, we are going to look at a lot of different people over uh, many different time periods. Uh, I just ask that you don't be overwhelmed by this. Uh, we are going to look at uh, many people we disagree with, but it's important to be able to learn from history how to interpret the New Testament and how not to interpret the New Testament. So uh, we're going to go back to the Reformation. We're not going to cover anything in this class before the Reformation. And I uh, tell you what, let me uh, enlarge this. Okay, and I've got my other computer uh, going now so I can see you all individually, which I couldn't before in the first half of this class. Um, the Reformation began when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the cathedral in Wittenberg, Germany. Um, Martin Luther was a Catholic monk who was burdened by a load of guilt because he knew that he was not perfect before God and he saw God as uh, in his righteousness condemning the guilty, but he never saw in the scriptures justification by faith. It was when he discovered justification by faith that his life was transformed and uh, his 95 thesis incorporated that he uh, attached it to the door of the cathedral in in Wittenberg Germany and he wasn't trying to break off from the Roman Catholic Church but he did want to reform the Roman Catholic Church and uh, from that the Protestant Reformation uh, occurred. Uh, the Reformation emphasized the importance of the Bible itself as the sole guide of faith and conduct rather than the, the church or the Bible as interpreted by the church. It also stressed the importance of uh, learning the original languages studying the Bible in its historical context and translating the Bible into the vernacular, into the languages of the people. Uh, up to that point, it was only in Latin uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. Along with the Reformation came the Enlightenment, which emphasized the rational nature of man human reason reigned supreme. The historical method also emerged during this time with an anti-supernaturalistic bias. So the Enlightenment emphasized the rational thinking. The mind was the, the final authority. So you didn't have to get authority from a book like the Bible or the church, uh, but it was the mind that was so important. And uh, the historical method, looking at um, events in scripture, applying a historical method that did not incorporate God. It didn't have room for God. And so that's why we say it has an anti supernaturalistic bias. Um, so it went in saying there's no God, so you can imagine what comes out. Um, a there was a scholar by the name of Johann Philip Gobbler, and he was the first to propose in 1787 that dogmatic theology be separated from biblical theology. Up to this point, the studying of the Bible was for the purpose of uh, verifying and establishing dogma, 
the teaching of the church. But Gobbler said biblical theology needs to be separate from that. It needs to be a discipline of its own. And once that is done, then you can go to dogmatic theology and base your dogmatic or systematic theology on your biblical theology. So Gobbler draws a distinction between religion and theology. Religion deals with what a person needs to know and believe in order to know God and be saved. And just a second here, we need to let somebody else in. Um, theology, on the other hand, has to do with the subtleties of Scripture and involves the use of philosophy and historical studies. So religion for Gobbler is for the common person. Theology is for the sophisticated scholar. Gobbler said that parts of the Bible uh, were eternal and divine, and parts of it were simply human. So he says that we need to study the Bible and sift out the parts that are human and just come up with the divine, and on that we would build our theology. So he says, go through the Bible and compare the writings of the biblical authors and compile the truths that are divine. Now, things like the law of Moses and Paul's teaching about women wearing veils, for example, would be considered human and temporary teaching, not divine and eternal. Now, he says, by, by doing this, it will yield a pure, unmixed, eternal teaching of Scripture. And so these are the teachings that apply to us today, according to Gobbler. So religion has to do with what a person knows, needs to know, to uh, have a relationship with God, to be saved. Biblical theology is the careful study of the Scriptures to discern what is human and divine, and uh, build a theology on that. And then dogmatic theology takes the results of biblical theology and incorporates philosophy, science, history, and many other forms of learning, and develops a sophisticated, fully rounded teaching of theological truth. Now, part of what Gobbler says, I think that we could agree with. Uh, for example, our systematic theology needs to be based on the Bible. The problem that would give us a problem, uh, the, the thing that would give us a problem here, is his saying parts of the Bible are divine and parts are human. Uh, the New Testament says all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable. So uh, I'm afraid we would have to disagree with Gobbler here. He was one of the, the uh, uh, forerunners here in the Enlightenment. Now, the Enlightenment ushered in the age that we call modernity, uh, from the word modern. It's that which is modern. The modern era, which lasted until the end of the 20th century, according to A.K.M. Adam, was characterized by four things. Okay, this is the Enlightenment, or the modern era. First of all, by newness. The emphasis is on what is happening now. It rejects the old, and it values the new. And this is because it believed progress is always happening. The old is primitive and inferior. The new is developed and superior. The latest thing is the best thing. And of course, 
after the latest thing is made, it isn't long before there's something else that's later. And after that, there's something else that's later. You know, you get the iPhone 12 and pretty soon the iPhone 13 is out. Well, you got to get the, the iPhone 13 because obviously it's better. And it goes on and on and on and on. So there is this emphasis on newness in the modern period. Secondly, there is an emphasis on chronology, time. There is a fascination with history to know where we came from and to see how far we have advanced. After all, if you think that you've uh, really advanced a long ways, you're going to want to celebrate that and acknowledge that and study that. Uh, it was in this environment that uh, the uh, science of historical criticism arose. Thirdly, the supremacy of reason. Modernity no longer listened to tradition or authority. Human rationality and science is the final authority for the modern period, the Enlightenment. And then elitism. Only those who have been highly trained should be listened to, according to this. Uh, the scholars have their private exclusive club, which the commoners cannot penetrate. And by the way, I uh, think that we can say that that still holds true today. Uh, the the uh, members of the guild, as they call it, or the academy, uh, have their club and they um, uh, speak to one another in that. Now, during, uh, well, let me pause here. Do you have any questions or comments here before we go on? Um, sir, is it possible yes. to get the recording of the courses? Yes. Um, there will be a playlist on YouTube. All in, right. In fact, the uh, the one from last time should already be there. Okay, so, thank you so, so you much. Can, you can get them. Yes, yes. Any other questions? Okay, are we all on the same page? You, are we following together? Okay. Uh, here we will mention a few scholars who, invo who were involved in the various quests for the historical Jesus, um, beginning with the first quest here. Now, this is part of what came in the modern period. Um, most works say that the first quest for the historical Jesus began with Herman Samuel Rymaris. Uh, Charles Worth said it began with a man by the name of Chubb and with the English Deus, um, but most people say it goes back to Rymaris. Rymaris wrote an essay critical of Christianity in which he saw Jesus as a political revolutionary who failed and was crucified. He said the disciples stole Jesus' body and rewrote history, saying that he was divine and that he would come back on the clouds. When it didn't happen, uh, they founded the old Catholic Church. Now, Rhymyris's purpose was anti-Christian. He wanted to disprove the entire Christian faith. And that's something that we're going to see uh, in this first quest for the historical Jesus, people applying anti-supernaturalistic uh, historical criticism to the life of Christ. So Rymaris took a historical approach. So in one sense, Rymaris did the church a, a service because he showed that the study of history is important for the study of the church, for Christian theology. Uh, you know, Christianity is deeply rooted in history. It is not a philosophy. It is not something born out of somebody's mind, but it is a response to what God has done in history. Now, Leander Keck says, it is not overstating the case that all historical study of Jesus is a critical appropriation of Rymaris' view or a debate with it. My, uh, Rymaris has been very influential, even though he lived uh, a couple hundred years ago. 
I want to mention another person involved in the first quest for the historical Jesus, Ferdinand Christian Bauer. Uh, he was a pro professor of church history and dogmatics in uh, Tübingen, Germany. And he developed an influential way of looking at the New Testament. Um, he and his followers became known as the Tübingen School after the university where Bauer uh, taught. He was greatly influenced by the writings of Friedrich Schleiermacher, who is called the father of liberalism, and he wrote a theology which eliminated the supernatural. Bauer was a radical naturalist who, like Schleiermacher, had no place for the supernatural. In other words, no place for God. So the function of the New Testament scriptures for him was not to teach us about God, not to help us become holy, uh, but it was to learn about this phenomenon of first century Christianity. For him, the New Testament was in no way revelatory or theologically authoritative. According to Bauer, uh, Jesus was the foundation of the New Testament's views, and then Bauer used the writings of Hegel, a uh, philosopher of his day, to uh, look at the New Testament through Hegel's eyes. And let me see if I can maybe uh, use a pencil here. Well, maybe I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, maybe I can. Hold on a second. I guess I can't. I'll have to work on that later. More technology issues here. Okay. Um, oh, okay. We've got there and I'll turn that off. Maybe I can do this. Okay. Um, Hegel's philosophy was that uh, there is a certain opinion or thesis And uh, there is a differing opinion or thesis called the antithesis. Um, so there's, there's one uh, way of saying things. What is happening here? Let me try it on here. Hold on. Okay, here's the thesis, and here is the antithesis. Uh, two different uh, beliefs held by different groups of people, two different groups. Uh, they disagree, but they, they dialogue and they work together and they come up with what is called the synthesis. This then becomes another thesis, and there is another antithesis. And the same thing happens it yields uh, another synthesis, which then in turn becomes another thesis, which deals with an antithesis, and it goes on and on like that. Um, Bauer applies this to the New Testament, and he says that uh, Jewish Christianity is the thesis, and Gentile Christianity is the antithesis. So he says in the first century, there are these two groups in the New Testament, the Jewish Christians uh, represented by Peter and the Gentile Christians represented by Paul. They disagree. And so he sees the New Testament as they trying to work out the uh, agreement between these two different groups in the New Testament. So the uh, synthesis here for Bauer is the old Catholic Church. In the old Catholic Church, 
they were brought together. He sees the book of Acts as a document uh, bringing the two uh, things together. Now, to fit his theory, only four books of the New Testament, or, or four epistles of Paul in the New Testament, he says were actually written by Paul. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Galatians. Um, now, he also applied this kind of thing to the Gospels. Most people rejected uh, Bauer's uh, beliefs here. But he has become extremely influential. We see his influence today. And um, Harris said, no single event ever changed the course of biblical scholarship as much as the appearance of the Tubingen school. All New Testament criticism and derivatively much Old Testament criticism from the 19th century finds its origin consciously or unconsciously in the school. Today, when you read liberal scholars, you see what you see their work, it has Bauer's fingerprints all over them. Now, I want to mention another person here by the name of David Friedrich Strauss. He was a follower of Bauer, and he also is influential here in a negative kind of way. He is credited with writing the first life of Jesus, and he was a radical anti-supernaturalist uh, supernaturalist who caustically tried to prove the non-historicity of the Gospels. In other words, he tried to prove that the Gospels were not truly historical documents. He says that the stories of Jesus were mythical, uh, attempts to communicate the eternal through natural stories. And he also followed Bauer in this uh, Hegel's philosophy of the thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Um, he, more than anyone before, tried to explain what we have in the New Testament as myth, as non-historical stories that try to get across an eternal truth. A while back, I talked to a graduate of APTS who has gone to the States. He's gotten his... Uh, his master's at a secular, excuse me, sec, uh, or a very liberal graduate school. He then got his PhD at a liberal uh, university. And he said to me, you know, maybe some of the stories in the Gospels are really parables. In other words, myths, things that didn't really happen. And, you know, if you go down that road, that is a very dangerous road to go down. Because once you say, what we have here didn't happen, then you are uh, really rejecting the gospel. Uh, he was the, Strauss was the first person to completely reject the historicity of the gospel of John. Now, his uh, writings were not accepted by most scholars. Uh, he refused to call himself a Christian. He put in his will that no uh, minister should officiate at his funeral. Uh, and yet he was influential in this whole process. He was influential on people, especially people like Albert Schweitzer and Rudolf Bultmann that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Here are some of the characteristics of the first quest. It used the historical critical method. More and more during this time, it was being used. In Old Testament scholarship, uh, belief in the authorship by Moses was pretty much abandoned, and uh, we have Wellhausen's JEDP theory of the sources of the Old Testament. Um, in the, the uh, New Testament, the pastoral epistles were assigned to the second century, uh, and the Old Testament was pretty much neglected by New Testament scholars. There was an emphasis on history rather than theology. So scholars were working basically with um, historical theories and not paying that much attention to theology. So here we have a division in the church. We have the common person, the person in the pew, who comes to church wanting to know about God. How can I have a relationship with God? And we have the scholars who are dealing with historical theories. 
and not concerned with God very much at all. So there uh, grew a great divide between the pew and the uh, scholar. We should also see uh, that the Jewishness of Jesus was greatly downplayed. Now, notice that all the names that I mentioned so far were Germans. In the middle of the 20th century, we had a phenomenon called the Holocaust. In Nazi Germany, six million Jews were killed by the Nazi government. And you know, it's interesting to ask the question, was there any connection between the, the idea that Jesus was not really very Jewish and the Holocaust? Uh, maybe there was, maybe there wasn't, but it's an interesting question to, uh, to entertain. Coming from the Enlightenment was the classical liberal position regarding the uh, content of the New Testament. The emphasis of the liberals was on the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God. Their ethics was the highest good. They emphasized a relationship to God as father. Um, some examples of scholars in this camp would be uh, Holtzman, Vernley, Harnack, and Ernest Renan. And uh, if you if you want those names, you can get it out of the, uh, uh, the uh, recording. Here are the, uh, well, it, uh, liberalism began with Schleiermacher. He is considered the father of liberalism. And here are the theological tenets of liberalism. First of all, there is no distinction between the natural and the supernatural. Uh, what this is basically saying is there is no God, no God outside of the natural universe. Jesus was man at his best. Um, he was not God in the flesh, as the church believes, but he was an ethical model, a display of the divine element in man. He was the standard by which to judge everything, including the Bible. There was no trinity in the classical sense. Um, and like I said, there was in fact a denial of the supernatural. God's wrath was replaced by an overemphasis on his love. So they saw no place for wrath on the part of God. Um, that uh, God, however they defined that, uh, was purely love. The kingdom of God was founded on the spiritual and ethical quality of the life of Jesus. So the important thing about Jesus was that he was a spiritual person and that he gave a great ethic. But for them, he was not a savior who came to save the world. There was no emphasis on the death and resurrection of Christ. Rather, the emphasis was on forming a just society. And then salvation was seen as the riddance of materialism and selfishness. Now, all of this led to a great interest in the social gospel, so that by the early 1900s, liberalism was pretty much identified with the social gospel. For the classical liberals and uh, their lives of Jesus, Jesus was the great nice guy. He taught a simple ethic of love your neighbor and your enemy and be really nice. But see, for them, he was not the son of God in an ontological sense, in his essence. Um, maybe in an allegorical sense, that he was closer to God than any other man, but not in the sense that he was the second person of the Trinity, preexistent before the creation of the world. Now, this liberal tendency was much stronger in Germany than in the United States and, and Britain. Now, there was a conservative reaction. Not everybody, not all scholars, bought into this uh, liberalism. 
So we have people like Hinstenberg and, and Hoffman. <coughs> uh, we have other uh, great scholars at this time, uh, like Lightfoot and others who uh, did not go down the liberal path. Um, Hoffman developed a concept called Heilsgeschichte. And uh, it's a German word, and it's translated in different ways. Uh, Heils means holy, Geschichte is history. So it can be translated holy history, it's sometimes translated redemptive history, salvation history, sacred history, the history of redemption or salvation, the history of God's saving acts. Um, Sulin uh, defines it this way. It's a th theological principle which interprets scripture as the ongoing story of God's redemptive activity in history. So it, um, it says that in the acts that we see in, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God is at work and God's plan, the plan of the New Testament is to see God at work in the uh, actions that we see happening in the New Testament. Uh, this was popularized by a scholar by the name of Von Rott in the Old Testament and Kuhlmann in the New Testament uh, during the 40s and 1950s. And uh, George Ladd in his great New Testament theology, for him, Heil's Geschichte is central the outworking of God's redemptive plan in history. Liberalism had its, its peak. We would say its heyday, uh, its, its time of most influence back at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, at that time, uh, there hadn't been any major wars for decades. New inventions were being made. You know, uh, Edison invented the light bulb and the phonograph. We had telephones, uh, airplanes were uh, invented. And uh, it was believed that mankind not only was developing uh, physically according to uh, uh, it, it just left me, Darwin, but also spiritually and, uh, and ethically. So that, you know, there was a saying that said, every day in every way, we are getting better. And it was believed that uh, as time went by, that this world would get better. We would spread the uh, message of Jesus, you know, be nice to one another. We would educate the world. We would build hospitals. We would raise the standard of living. And if Jesus came back, he could just step in and everybody would accept him and, uh, and things would be great. Things were just getting better, and uh, that was their eschatology. But there were three things that broke the, the, uh, the hold of liberalism on theology. The first thing was World War I. World War I was the first worldwide war. It was the worst war that had ever happened in the history of the world. It was a wake-up call for the liberals who were saying every day in every way, we are getting better. We weren't getting better. And World War I proved that. These great inventions uh, that had come along could be used to kill people with. You could drop bombs from airplanes. The second thing was the sinking of the Titanic. The Titanic represented mankind's greatest achievement. It was the ship that even God couldn't sink, they said, uh, but it sank. And it put things into perspective about how far mankind had actually come. And the third thing was a commentary written by a, a young scholar by the name of Karl Barth on Romans. Karl Barth was a Swiss man. He had been trained by the great liberal theologians of his day he became a pastor in Switzerland and realized that all the things he had been taught by the liberals 
were irrelevant to the lives of the people in his church. He wrote a book, a commentary on Romans, and it had a huge impact. One person has described it as a bomb going off in the liberals' playground. Karl Barth went on to become the most influential theologian of the 20th century. These three things broke the domination that liberalism had on theology uh, in the first part of the 20th century. What was the Jesus of the first quest for the historical Jesus like? It basically was the Jesus of liberalism that we mentioned earlier. For the quest, Jesus was a non-eschatological, de-Judaized teacher who taught the universal fatherhood of God and basically said that we should love everybody. It was not eschatological in the sense that he did not see in his life and ministry the uh, fulfilling of the prophecies of the Old Testament, according to the first quest. He was, his Judaism was not emphasized, his Jewishness. Um, he was a mere man and nothing more, according to them. He was not God in an ontological sense. He was not the second person of the Trinity. He was basically a teacher teaching an ethic rather than a savior who came to die for the sins of the world. Okay, we will stop there. Uh, before we go, does anybody have a question that you would like to ask? I know we've thrown a lot of information at you, a lot of names, a lot of words. Um, yes, Bayan? Yeah, quick question. At, at this time, did anyone uh, actually address all the major uh, colonial powers that were still abusing uh, the colonies, like the British in India and, and the Belgians in um, Leopold's people massacring all those people in the Congo and the Indonesians, the Dutch, the Indonesians, of course, the Spanish and the Filipinos, and of course, the, the, the Portuguese in South Africa. Was this ever brought up during this liberal that if we're supposed to be like God, well, why are all these people subjugating and it's never brought up? I, I, I don't see the connection. Was there a disconnect? Um, I, I would say yes and no. I, I don't think that New Testament scholars uh, dealt with that, not that I know of. But there was a great movement, a great missions movement by liberals to give the social gospel, uh -huh. to uh, establish schools right. and hospitals, yeah. to raise the uh, uh, standard of living among people. And so, um, yeah, I, I would say it's yes and no. It, it did yeah. work in the Philippines with the Thomasites, especially up in the northern Luzon area. You know, okay. there's a lot there, but I don't know if that was part of the liberalism or it was just a good heart. Oh, you yeah, should have the Thomasites. Thomasites. They came on the USS Thomas, on the okay. SS Thomas, okay. and they improved the Filipino lot. Uh, All right. the, the way thank, the Filipinos thank you, Brian. Uh, any other questions before we go? All right, we will stop here. We will see you on Friday morning, Baguio time. Uh, may the Lord bless you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm.